Jacinda Ardern has been re-elected in a landslide. Her Labour Party had become the first party to win an absolute majority of seats since proportional representation was introduced in New Zealand in the 1990s, and they've won the, the greatest vote share of any party in 50 years. And we can take a look now at her victory speech. Ina mana, ina mana, ina reo, ina tangera finua o Aotearoa, e tika ana te korero, e hara taku toa e te toa takitahi, he toa taku tini ke, no reira tato e hui hui mai nei, ka hoaki tono tato. Tonight. New Zealand has shown the Labour Party its greatest support in at least 50 years. We have seen that support in both urban areas and in rural areas, in seats we may have hoped for, but in those equally we may not have expected. And for that, I only have two simple words. Thank you. Thank you to the people who worked so hard to share our message. So Jacinda Ardern, they're starting with uh, speaking in the Maori language, so the Maori people are the indigenous people of, of New Zealand. They're sort of projecting, you know, as, as she's sort of famous internationally for sort of inclusive um, identity, obviously, after the Christchurch massacre, she she made headlines and front pages the world over, and um, by wearing a headscarf, she sort of talked about how this should not undermine New Zealand as an inclusive society. Um, but probably, you know, the most significant um, element that sort of underlies and explains her victory is her handling of coronavirus. So by acting quickly, blocking off travel into and out of the country, the Kiwi Prime Minister has limited COVID deaths in the country to 25. I compare that to this country, what, 40,000 deaths or o over 40,000 deaths. That is pretty phenomenal. Um, but when anyone wins this big, so 49% she got in that election, obviously many people sort of gather around or, or try and claim her politics as theirs. Um, so anyone who's been on left Twitter today will see that many different wings within the British Labour Party are trying to say, ah, Ardern is one of us. This is how you win big. Um, I think some of it's not as informed as it, it could be. Um, but I'm not going to be here to tell you who Jacinda Ardern is because I'm not an expert on New Zealand politics either. Um, so today I spoke to someone who is. And in fact, it's someone who has intimate knowledge of the Labour parties in the UK and New Zealand. So Max Harris is a former advisor to John McDonnell and author of The New Zealand Project. And my first question to Max was whether, to be honest, politics even mattered in this election. Was it not just a referendum on Ardern's world-beating handling of coronavirus? Yeah, I think a big part of it is, um, is about how she dealt with coronavirus and, and people have talked about it as the COVID election in New Zealand. But obviously that's political in itself, right? Um, and it's, it's interesting to note that, that most of the response to coronavirus in New Zealand has relied on quite an active, coordinated state um, that has been involved in, in testing um, and with you know, much less use of kind of contracting out and consultants than you see in, in the UK. So I think the first political question is kind of like, what, what do we take out of her response to coronavirus? But then also I think the election has been about other issues. So the, the right-wing National Party um, kind of tacked even further to the right, pushed um, tax cuts, a narrative of personal responsibility, slightly like bizarrely talking about obesity in the final week of the election, even though that's not a major political issue in New Zealand. Um, so it was a it was a debate about uh, more than just coronavirus, and, and obviously it matters to the to the kind of shape of, of the next three years in New Zealand to to, to get a clearer handle on on the politics of this Labour government. And a suggestion I saw today, it was in The Guardian, I think, is that one of the reasons right-wing populism hasn't been as successful in New Zealand as elsewhere, I mean, predominantly Australia and, and the UK and the United States, is that Murdoch doesn't own any newspapers there. I mean, I don't know what you think about that particular theory. Yeah, it, it was interesting to read that piece, and I, I read it. Um, I think there are elements of, of populist traditions in, in New Zealand as well. Um, I think there's something to that, for sure. Um, but actually, yeah, we, we did see quite a right-wing um, campaign being launched um, by the national government. Um, I saw another New Zealand journalist, um, Henry Cook, uh, say that what Labour succeeded in doing this election was like neutralising the right-wingers on the economy um, and then centering their health response, and kind of social democratic health response. So I think there's 
there's quite a lot to that. Um, but I wouldn't rule out elements of right-wing populism being on the rise in, in the future um, at all. And I think that, you know, the media is only one kind of part of, of right-wing populism in other places as well. And what can we expect from this government? So it's the first time that any party has had an absolute majority since proportional representation was introduced in, in 1996. Yeah. So she, she could have potentially much more leeway than any prime minister in recent New Zealand history, Kiwi history. Um, yeah. What can we expect her to, to do in this three-year term? Yeah, well, it was a very centrist campaign with a very limited manifesto. So um, I think people on the, on the kind of left, radical left in New Zealand aren't really like holding their breath for a, um, for a, a very uh, dramatic set of changes to come. I mean, just to, to give one example of that, the, the Labour manifesto committed to, uh, I think, 480 million New Zealand dollars in new spending commitments over four years. Obviously, New Zealand's a lot smaller than the UK, but when you think that, um, you know, the, the, the uh, 2019 Corbyn Manifesto was, you know, about 83 billion of annual spending, this is like an entirely different scale of ambition. Um, so um, I think we also saw three years of pretty limited um, government progress despite a, a rhetoric of transformation. Um, that said, I think uh, there are a couple of areas to look out for. Um, so I mentioned before sectoral collective bargaining um, or what's called fair pay agreements in New Zealand, which could be a genuinely progressive way to empower trade unions. And um, they've also talked about criminal justice reform and there was a cannabis referendum um, at the same time as the election, which we're still waiting on the results for, which could kickstart some more, at least social democratic criminal justice reform. Um, and I think a lot turns on the Green Party and the governing arrangements that the Labour Party will have with uh, the Green Party and possibly the Māori Party, which also won a seat. Um, so the Green Party probably has more people sympathetic to the Corbyn project than the Labour Party in New Zealand. Um, and proposed, for example, like a wealth tax, which the Labour Party's ruled out, um, but also has policies like um, opt-out trade union membership. Um, if the Green Party can get a, a foothold or if, if popular movements outside of Parliament um, are able to shift political culture, I think um, we may see more change. But um, I think anyone expecting sort of radical public ownership, for example, um, shouldn't be holding their breath. That was Max Harris on Jacinda Ardern. Um, I'm bringing Dahlia back in now because I want to I want to talk a bit about how this is sort of uh, the fallout from this particular victory in in the United Kingdom. Was she a Blairite? Does she prove that the third way is the way to win elections? Was she a Corbynite and she proves that you have to be bold and anti-capitalist um, if you want to get 49 percent of the vote? And before I go to you, I actually just want to bring up this one. Uh, this article, which shows you, you know, she's not a Blairite, as some might suggest. She described capitalism as a blatant failure. Um, and she also, she worked briefly, not for Tony Blair, but in the cabinet office when he was prime minister. She said she didn't want to work for Tony Blair. So she, she doesn't identify as a Blairite, but she's clearly not a Corbynite. Dahlia, what, what do you make of all of this? Are you claiming Jacinda Ardern for your, for your own brand of politics? Well, I think obviously, you know, anyone who in kind of British politics says something like capitalism is an utter failure is branded as far left. I think that what she probably represents is actually you know, kind of quite a traditional social democratic kind of position. Um, she's not like outwardly explicitly hostile to black and brown people, although I know that there has been um, a lot of contention, particularly from kind of Maori, uh, the Maori population around um, her, her, her leadership. So, you know, but the fact that, so I think that the, it just kind of shows, I guess, how right wing the, the pendulum has genuine, generally gone that, you know, someone who just, objectively can observe that capitalism is not working and that you know climate change is real and that is uh, it's urgent and that maybe we shouldn't be maybe islamophobia should not form a cornerstone of our politics is kind of seen as such a sigh of relief but i think i wonder you know to what extent actually you know and obviously this is you know i'm not an expert in new zealand politics and kiwi politics but i wonder you know how to what extent the coronavirus pandemic you know we've spoken about it as a kind of shock doctrine and how it's being used to kind of solidify the control of the private sector on our healthcare systems in the uk etc but i wonder how to what extent the coronavirus pandemic has knocked the kind of strongman right-wing populist version like kind of governance 
that has gained particular popularity over the past sort of like five years. Um, whatever you want to say about Jacinda Ardern, you can say that she definitely represents an opposition um, somewhat to that kind of strong man, uh, sort of proto, you know, very far right sort of proto fascist sort of government system of governance and the fact that in the countries that have such leaders you know whether it's the us brazil uh, etc you know have have had disastrous responses to coronavirus and particularly when these kind of strongman politics their biggest appeal is that in times of crisis we will take control and the fact that they fail to do that i think has been a massive blow to their legitimacy and to their appeal uh, so i kind of wonder on a sort of global level um to you know that kind of like that fact in in addition to the fact that even within the context of New, Ze New Zealand history uh, this is a massive victory for for the Labour Party uh, that you know there is something there to be said about how the failure of these sort of so-called strong man you know very patriarchal politicians to kind of look after the national family at this time of crisis um, has kind of demystified and broken that myth a little bit. I wouldn't speak too soon, but it was the kind of first thing that I thought of when I read the news today. Mm. I mean, I think that's a really good point. And actually, probably it's her relationship to the coronavirus crisis, which is not only more relevant, but also more interesting in terms of the extent of her victory. Because you have to think, you know, who has both done quite well when it comes to coronavirus, but also has you know, massively increased their esteem among the public during this crisis. And the three people I can think of, you know, most prominently, who most obviously come to mind, I suppose other than Xi Jinping for sort of defeating the virus in China, is, is Nicola Sturgeon, Angela Merkel, and Jacinda Ardern, all people who, you know, all, all relatively centrist, but who mm -hmm. have sort of come out and said, I'm going to be honest with you here, I'm going to err on the side of caution, and who have, you know, that has really been appreciated by their respective mm. publics, like the complete opposite of what Boris Johnson and Donald Trump have done, which is to say, you know, we're going to take some risks and we're also going to make this all about ourselves. We're not going to be particularly honest with you. We're going to tr try constantly play politics out of this. I'm not saying, you know, maybe Nicola Sturgeon is playing politics out of this, but she's definitely doing it a damn sight less obviously than Boris Johnson. And, and you can see actually a kind of, a kind of leadership that whilst it might not be transformative, at least makes people feel you know, reassured in the middle of a, of a global pandemic, which does count for something, eh? Yeah, and I think, you know, th those three figures that you mentioned come from different parts of the political spectrum, but all of them are kind of very, you know, in their presentation and in what they project, the kind of particular, like the very gendered, like racialized politics upon which they rely is very different to that which you know is represented by those kind of strong men figures that i mentioned whose whose only function is to be able to do swift bold action in times of crisis but have failed mm -hmm.